In this video, I'll read seven stories to help you practice your English listening and comprehension. Look in the description of this video for timings if you want to select a specific story. Look for subtitles in your language. Story 17 The Longest Suspension Bridge in the World Verrazano, an Italian about whom little is known, sailed into New York Harbor in 1524 and named it Angelame. He described it as a very agreeable situation located within two small hills in the midst of which flowed a great river. Though Verrazano is by no means considered to be a great explorer, his name will probably remain immortal. For on November 21st, 1964, the longest suspension bridge in the world was named after him. The Verrazano Bridge, which was designed by Othmar Amman, joins Brooklyn to Staten Island. It has a span of 4,260 feet. The bridge is so long that the shape of the earth had to be taken into account by its designer. Two great towers support four huge cables. The towers are built on immense underwater platforms made of steel and concrete. The platforms extend to a depth of over 100 feet under the sea. These alone took 16 months to build. Above the surface of the water, the towers rise to a height of nearly 700 feet. They support the cables from which the bridge has been suspended. Each of the four cables contains 26,108 lengths of wire. It has been estimated that if the bridge were packed with cars, it would still only be carrying a third of its total capacity. However, size and strength are not the only important things about this bridge. Despite its immensity, it is both simple and elegant, fulfilling its designer's dream to create an enormous object drawn as faintly as possible. Story 18 Electric Currents in Modern Art Modern sculpture rarely surprises us anymore. The idea that modern art can only be seen in museums is mistaken. Even people who take no interest in art cannot have failed to notice examples of modern sculpture on display in public places. Strange forms stand in gardens and outside buildings and shops. We have got quite used to them. Some so-called modern pieces 
have been on display for nearly 80 years. In spite of this, some people, including myself, were surprised by a recent exhibition of modern sculpture. The first thing I saw when I entered the art gallery was a notice which said, do not touch the exhibits. Some of them are dangerous. The objects on display were pieces of moving sculpture. Oddly shaped forms that are suspended from the ceiling and move in response to a gust of wind are quite familiar to everybody. These objects, however, were different. Lined up against the wall, there were long, thin wires attached to metal spheres. The spheres had been magnetized and attracted or repelled each other all the time. In the center of the hall, there were a number of tall structures which contained colored lights. These lights flickered continuously like traffic lights, which have gone mad. Sparks were emitted from small black boxes and red lamps flashed on and off angrily. It was rather like an exhibition of prehistoric electronic equipment. These peculiar forms not only seemed designed to shock people emotionally, but to give them electric shocks as well. Story 19. A Very Dear Cat Kidnappers are rarely interested in animals, but they recently took considerable interest in Mrs. Eleanor Ramsey's cat. Mrs. Eleanor Ramsey, a very wealthy old lady, has shared a flat with her cat Rastus for a great many years. Rastus leads an orderly life. He usually takes a short walk in the evenings and is always home by seven o'clock. One evening, however, he failed to arrive. Mrs. Ramsey got very worried she looked everywhere for him, but could not find him. Three days after Rastus' disappearance, Mrs. Ramsey received an anonymous letter. The writer stated that Rastus was in safe hands and would be returned immediately if Mrs. Ramsey paid a ransom of 1,000 pounds. Mrs. Ramsey was instructed to place the money in a cardboard box and to leave it outside her door. At first, she decided to go to the police, but fearing that she would never see Rastus again, the letter had made that quite clear, she changed her mind. She withdrew 1,000 pounds from her bank and followed the kidnapper's instructions. The next morning, the box had disappeared, but 
Mrs. Ramsey was sure that the kidnapper would keep his word. Sure enough, Rastus arrived punctually at seven o'clock that evening. He looked very well, though he was rather thirsty, for he drank half a bottle of milk. The police were astounded when Mrs. Ramsey told them what she had done. She explained that Rastus was very dear to her. Considering the amount she paid, he was dear in more ways than one. Story 20 Pioneer Pilots In 1908, Lord Northcliffe offered a prize of 1,000 pounds to the first man who would fly across the English Channel. Over a year passed before the first attempt was made. On July 19th, 1909, in the early morning, Hubert Latham took off from the French coast in his plane, the Antoinette IV. He had traveled only seven miles across the channel when his engine failed and he was forced to land on the sea. The Antoinette floated on the water until Latham was picked up by a ship. Two days later, Louis Blériot arrived near Calais with a plane called Number 11. Blériot had been making planes since 1905 and this was his latest model. A week before, he had completed a successful overland flight during which he covered 26 miles. Latham, however, did not give up easily. He, too, arrived near Calais on the same day with a new Antoinette. It looked as if there would be an exciting race across the channel. Both planes were going to take off on July 25th, but Latham failed to get up early enough. After making a short test flight at 4.15 a.m., Blerio set off half an hour later. His great flight lasted 37 minutes. When he landed near Dover, the first person to greet him was a local policeman. Latham made another attempt a week later and got within half a mile of Dover, but he was unlucky again. His engine failed and he landed on the sea for the second time. Story 21 Daniel Mendoza Boxing matches were very popular in England 200 years ago. In those days, boxers fought with bare fists for prize money. Because of this, they were known as prize fighters. However, boxing was very crude, for there were no rules, and a prize fighter could be seriously injured or even killed during a match. One of the most colorful figures in boxing history was Daniel Mendoza, who was born in 1764. 
The use of gloves was not introduced until 1860 when the Marquis of Queensbury drew up the first set of rules. Though he was technically a prize fighter, Mendoza did much to change crude prize fighting into a sport, for he brought science to the game. In his day, Mendoza enjoyed tremendous popularity. He was adored by rich and poor alike. Mendoza rose to fame swiftly after a boxing match when he was only 14 years old. This attracted the attention of Richard Humphreys, who was then the most eminent boxer in England. He offered to train Mendoza and his young pupil was quick to learn. In fact, Mendoza soon became so successful that Humphreys turned against him. The two men quarreled bitterly, and it was clear that the argument could only be settled by a fight. A match was held at Stilton, where both men fought for an hour. The public bet a great deal of money on Mendoza, but he was defeated. Mendoza met Humphreys in the ring on a later occasion, and he lost for a second time. It was not until his third match in 1790 that he finally beat Humphreys and became champion of England. Meanwhile, he founded a highly successful academy and even Lord Byron became one of his pupils. He earned enormous sums of money and was paid as much as 100 pounds for a single appearance. Despite this, he was so extravagant that he was always in debt. After he was defeated by a boxer called Gentleman Jackson, he was quickly forgotten. He was sent to prison for failing to pay his debts and died in poverty in 1836. Story 22 by Heart Some plays are so successful that they run for years on end. In many ways, this is unfortunate for the poor actors who are required to go on repeating the same lines night after night. One would expect them to know their parts by heart and never have cause to falter. Yet, this is not always the case. A famous actor in a highly successful play was once cast in the role of an aristocrat who had been imprisoned in the Bastille for 20 years. In the last act, a jailer would always come onto the stage with a letter which he would hand to the prisoner. Even though the noble was expected to read the letter at each performance, he always insisted that it should be written out in full. One night, the jailer decided to play a joke on his colleague to find out if, after so many performances, he had managed to learn the contents of the letter by heart. The curtain went up on the final act of the play 
and revealed the aristocrat sitting alone behind bars in his dark cell. Just then, the jailer appeared with the precious letter in his hands. He entered the cell and presented the letter to the aristocrat. But the copy he gave him had not been written out in full as usual. It was simply a blank sheet of paper. The jailer looked on eagerly, anxious to see if his fellow actor had at least learned his lines. The noble stared at the blank sheet of paper for a few seconds. Then, squinting his eyes, he said, The light is dim. Read the letter to me. And he promptly handed the sheet of paper to the jailer. Finding that he could not remember a word of the letter either, the jailer replied, The light is indeed dim, sire. I must get my glasses. With this, he hurried off the stage. Much to the aristocrat's amusement, the jailer returned a few moments later with a pair of glasses and the usual copy of the letter which he proceeded to read to the prisoner. Story 23 One Man's Meat is Another Man's Poison People become quite illogical when they try to decide what can be eaten and what cannot be eaten. If you lived in the Mediterranean, for instance, you would consider octopus a great delicacy. You would not be able to understand why some people find it repulsive. On the other hand, your stomach would turn at the idea of frying potatoes in animal fat the normally accepted practice in many northern countries. The sad truth is that most of us have been brought up to eat certain foods and we stick to them all our lives. No creature has received more praise and abuse than the common garden snail. Cooked in wine, snails are a great luxury in various parts of the world. There are countless people who, ever since their early years, have learned to associate snails with food. My friend Robert lives in a country where snails are despised. As his flat is in a large town, he has no garden of his own. For years, he has been asking me to collect snails from my garden and take them to him. The idea never appealed to me very much, but one day, after a heavy shower, I happened to be walking in my garden when I noticed a huge number of snails taking a stroll on some of my prize plants. Acting on a sudden impulse, I collected several dozen, put them in a paper bag, and took them to Robert. Robert was delighted to see me and equally pleased with my little gift. I left the bag in the hall 
and Robert and I went into the living room where we talked for a couple of hours. I had forgotten all about the snails when Robert suddenly said that I must stay for dinner. Snails would, of course, be the main dish. I did not fancy the idea, and I reluctantly followed Robert out of the room. To our dismay, we saw that there were snails everywhere. They had escaped from the paper bag and had taken complete possession of the hall. I have never been able to look at a snail since then.